Hi, welcome to this Open Security Summit session in 2020, so April 2023. We're going to be talking about risk in the modern tech space. So we got some high, super experienced, hyper knowledge panelists here. So maybe Isaac give a quick intro and Marius, and then let's take Marius, from there. First. Hi guys, my name is Marius, uh, Vice President of Cybersecurity for Global Financial Services. Um, yeah, I've been around cyber for, for a little while, so heavily involved in, you know, building risk treatment plans in modern tech space. So uh, hopefully we have an interesting conversation with the guys this evening. Yep, and me, I'm uh, a senior staff uh, engineer at Datadog, and uh, focusing on the uh, the security products over there and lately for the last 10 or so years been discussing this risk thing quite a lot uh, both from the side of uh, uh, the customer like figuring out what is risk and from the side of the uh, the producer saying how how are you going to explain risk to other people and as we can see Dean is in the, it was in the middle of a very risky operation trying to <laughs> go from one place to another in the rain yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cycling through central London. So I know it's less risky these days, man. It's it's they're, they're cycle lanes now. It's very civilized. When I was, you know, the risk analysis 15 years ago was way worse than now, right? <laughs> <laughs> so 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 for me, risk. I think I had a number of epiphanies on risk. Uh, you know, I guess in my journey, you know, especially once I can start to, I started to visualize and think of risk as graphs and then maps. I guess one, one of the reasons, you know, and me and Lisa already had several of worldly map sessions, right? But again, one of the reasons why for me, worldly maps clicked was because I was already thinking a lot in terms of risk um, as a graph. And then, you know, when I realized that you can think of it also as maps, it, it, you have a huge amount of context. But, and I, and I feel like, you know, for me, the, the big interest here is how do you make this scale? Which is also why I think things like GPT-like technologies are, probably one of the missing pieces of the puzzle because he allows us to process data and maybe tree maps if you want to like that right or in a, in a much more scalable and pragmatic way but also in a way to customize the message to the audience so why don't we kind of start there right like in terms of how to capture risk and then present it so that the audience understands um, the risk that they're taking and makes good risk decisions Marius, do you want to take that one first? Yeah. Well, I, th I think the problem normally I think we face, because if we start talking about, you know, qualitative risk management, it, it's it's normally starts with somewhere a finger in the wind. Because you it's normally you do a three by three, five by five matrix. It, you have to sort of start some ways and it's so how and then once you develop enough of the risks and enough of the, you know framework around it then you can sort sort of gauge in between how you know how we define what's risky and what's not and then i guess you know we define what's you know what do we care about by you know qualitative risk management and then we define by qualitative um, by quantitative risk management whether it's worth doing or not and and that's normally i, I see organizations kind of marry those two the problem is i think in nowadays, and, and I see a lot of actually the last few posts that I've been talking with some professionals in the space. The problem is, how do you report the risk further up the chain? And how do you get buy in? Because the problem is, normally I see some security professionals, they report things like, you know, vulnerabilities found, incidents, because they can't define how to report risks and how to put it in tangent numbers so the board will understand. And that's where normally I think that normally the problems arise. I don't know what's your experience with that is, uh, but that's where I see the big problems normally happening. So, I agree with you completely. And it's interesting that immediately, immediately you took the risk to the board. And I'll agree that that's usually where we see this thing expressed. Those are the people who apparently are the most interested in risk, mm -hmm. at least in the quantitative uh, uh, side of risk. And it, it, Actually, you just popped that in my head. I mean, if, if we take it to the other side, to the developer, they are more interested in the qualitative side of risk, right? And that's where I think that the notion of risk becomes more important than the 
definition of risk. I mean, the formal definition that I have always been taught is that risk equals probability times impact. Impact is usually dollars, right? Yeah. And probability is whatever be between zero and one. So risk in that equation becomes dollars. And one thing that I have noticed is that come to a developer and talk to them about risk in terms of dollars. They're not really interested. They're interested to know, is this bad, is this good? And then you pop into info, low, medium, high, critical. And immediately the first question that you're going to get from developer is why? And that's when you fall back. You fall, fall back into the probability times impact. Well, there's a probability of X that this impact is going to happen. And then the next question that they ask you is why? And that's where people start moving their hands very fast in the air because basically nobody knows the probability, yeah. right? We, we, we don't know what the probability of attack is. That, that it, it depends on so many things and so many things that we absolutely have no control over. Yeah. Denise, you were going to say something? <laughs> oh, you garbled. I think he's gone. So, so I'm going to continue my rant. Try to switch. We are losing. I can you. hear you guys. Okay. <laughs> We can't hear you, Dennis. The, the winds of London are stronger than you. All right. What, what about now? I'm just moving around. So, is that better? Else? Oh, now it's better. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Yes, no? Cool. Yeah, what, what I was saying is that I, I think you, you jumped massively right there, right? Because Yes, there, there's a number of risks that I think is hard to measure the probability, right? Fair enough, right? And, but I would argue that these days, you have lots of data, right? There's lots of data that you can start to make some very good fact-based analysis on, on your environment, on the company that you work for. No. Nope. You have, man. Like, you know, nope. whatever company, no, whoa, 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 look, whatever company you work for has a history of incidents, right? No. Nope. Whatever, whatever, well, you should have. Well, please say, okay, if you're telling me that I just arrived at a company, they haven't then been doing cybersecurity. No, if, you know, if, they, even they if they have, that. even if they have, what does that tell me about the future? Well, it nothing. tells you, well, not, not necessarily. I right? like if, if you give me a mapping on what are your trade agents, right? What kind of attacks you see? What attack surface you have, right? What is the business model of the attackers, right? I can already tell you to a certain degree the kind of vulnerabilities, the kind of exploits you will have, right? Like, you know, what kind of monitoring you have in place, what kind of impact but you have. You, know, you are so asking, you are asking for a, things. Uh, you are asking for a huge job of threat intelligence to come back at the same list of vulnerabilities that we keep going back to all the time. So just fix those. No, because you need context, right? Because the vulnerabilities depends on context, right? But, Without but that's context. The thing. A vulnerability is just, you know, in fact, there's a lot of business have vulnerabilities by design, right? Like their business model is a fucking vulnerability, right? All right. So, so uh, you know, let's say that your company had 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 a, 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 an ATO incident. Does yeah. that mean that the next thing that you're going to have is an ATO incident? No, it means that ATO incidents happen. Sure. But, but you, if, you don't know if the, 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 the chance of the next one is 65%, 95%. It will happen at some point. No, no, no. It, it matters, right? Because it depends how the ATO going there, right? Like, like for, for example, like one, one of the, and I, I think in, in risk, we have to have a level of objectivity, right? It's like, I found that if I don't have a data to support a point, you know, let's say, for example, inside the threat, right? You say that inside the threat is a problem, let's say, right? But I, I would argue in some companies, there's no evidence of inside the threat. And also, if there was an ins a malicious insider, the amount of damage they could do is massive, right? So that company current business model is based on them, right? Not having malicious insiders. Now, that's an important distinction because you need to focus on what is their real threat, right? Because when you go and say, and this is why I go, I like that risk, quantifying the risk, right? So if you, if you have 
to have a pragmatic conversation with boards and with execs, right? You need to be able to say, this is the things that we worry about. These are the things that we're not worried about. These are the things that at the moment we cannot do anything about unless you double our budget, <laughs> right? Because we just don't have the, the capacity. And, and that's a risk-based conversation. I, I guess that my point is that at some point you you stop talking about risk and you start talking about priorities. And priorities are much easier to explain than risk. The, the language of risk at some point connects itself to the language of insurance, right? That there there are that there is enough data yes. out there to say that uh, a male of a certain age of a certain background has X chances yeah. of having a heart attack by I don't know when. That there is enough yeah. data for that. On the other hand, priority without risk. You can't. On the other hand, for risk, for our risk, yeah. a lot of what you see is casino mat. It's people like like Brooke famously says it's casino mat. You see people like just throwing coins in the air and saying, dude, the chances of an attack happening is X. Even having the data that you that you mentioned, the context that you mentioned, which is very, very important, I agree with you, you still don't come out with data that should be considered totally actionable. I'm not sure about, let, let, let's explore that concept of how can you set priorities without having a good level of risk? And, and maybe let me just define this. I like to think of risk as a series of whys, right? Is a five whys. You, so it's almost like a, it's a graph, right? You start with a vulnerability. In fact, a vulnerability is a fact that has security implications, right? So I want to say a fact is that server unpatched. That's a fact, right? But I could say, well, that server is unpatched with this type of thing that has a security vulnerability on it. Cool. Now you ask, why does that matter, right? And you keep asking why until you hit some very top level items, right? So it could be that it matters because it holds highly confidential data. Well, yeah, then that matters, right? It matters because it's connected to the internet. Yes, but, but, but it's... You, you see, it's what I said about the developer. You, you went into five whys. I said the developers yeah. into two. So having those five is great. As no, no, but the five whys is... Yeah, but the five whys is how you go to the top. And every, every five, every, every answer to a why is almost at the management layer, right? That's great. If at some point you don't come and say the probability is X, because you will never be able to support that X. That, that's my whole point. Yeah, but there's places where you can say you can you can define probability, right? And then and I would argue that these days, when you're hitting places where the probability is really low, probably means you should be this if you want. With 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 more or less risk appetites, fair enough. But in a lot of organizations, I would argue that if you cannot make a valid logical reason why that's a fucking problem right then you know get another job right it's like there you go you know, right you know it's you should be able to right because you should say look you have a freaking server connected to the internet with a with a wrong vulnerability there's known exploits five companies are exploited over there there's a high possibility that you're going to be hacked next right versus wait, wait i I, yeah. I want to hear mario's view because he comes yeah. from an executive point of view rather than the logic of the the things that chain miles yeah well i always have a view you know because we, we we've been talking a lot about risk in terms of threat actors and attacks there's a much wider enterprise risk that i yeah consider when i start talking because we start talking about business continuity planning disaster recovery yeah yeah and we we talk about obviously threat actors, but you know there's there's lots of other things that come into you know talking about business impact analysis and critical systems that not necessarily yeah. talking only about patches, but talking about business continuity of operations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the key, pro I think. And especially nowadays, in, in I work in the fintech space, you know, in kind of new sort of you know they don't have legacy systems, but we have you know I'm 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 a big proponent as well when we start talking about risk. And because normally, you know, even my post today, I think I'm a big proponent about, you know, creating a narrative when you go to the board. You need to know then, who you're talking to. You need yep. to know the language you need to use. But security normally is always viewed as a cost center. So how do you change the narrative from becoming not only cost center, but becoming a potentially a money saving person? And secondly, 
becoming, creating a security solution and programs and strategies to gain competitive advantage against companies that you might be competing for tenders or competing in the same sort of, you know, environment. So if you create a narrative, you know, not only talking about risk, but as, as Yuzan mentioned, talking about probabilities, but talking about, you know, how do we do security to gain competitive advantage? How do we embed application security program into, you know, DevSecOps life cycles to, uh, to make our product the best in yeah. class so that every single client yeah. that comes and, and puts their customer data with us, they are safe. So that becomes a, a much more of a conversation, not only about risk, but about all of these other things. And I think that's that's normally normally. And, the and, what, and what you just and what you just done with that is you you anchor a lot of I would say top level risks that you can use as leverage to 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 put context into the risks at the bottom. See, so is that when you say how do we get a developer to do X? First of all, the developers don't do stuff because they like it or not. Like, they'll do stuff because on a fucking Kanban board. Right? If it's not a Kanban board, they're not going to do it. So the developer is not even the most important person to do. It is the PM, is whoever owns the Kanban board, they're the ones who need to take responsibility. But I, I like what Marius you were talking about, has also taken into account the business continuity, like the business elements, right? The business practice, because, sorry, the business properties, because that's, the, that's where it matters, right? So you could argue that, for example, if I make, if I change this in security, I'm now reducing the risk of business continuity. That's a very valid reason to do it. That has a lot of strength, right? Because it means that we're gonna make these changes to some part of the business, but we're gonna improve, not just the risk of data loss or the risk of financial, but we're gonna improve the risk of, for example, disruption or, 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 or lack of business continuity. And, and that's what I mean, the five whys, because when you follow the risk, you arrive at those at the top. The key mm -hmm. is to make sure that you have context. And that's the problem that most people have. The problem that we have is that we, we, we don't easily connect this action on the ground, which is reality, make this change, patch this, fix this, make whatever, right? To almost what is the business impact, actually positive or negative mm -hmm. in the business, yeah. right? And I think that's the context. That's what we want to do, right? We need to be following this in a data-driven way and, and not knowing something is data, right? Like I could say, I have no visibility on what the hell happened over there. So you have to accept the risk of that. And, and, and that to me translates into the priority, right? Because as, as Mario said, the narrative is important, yeah. but the narrative is important both at the board level and at the developer level. Yeah. I, I agree with you, oh, developers will want to do, developers will want to do what's on the Kanban board, but the place where we come yeah. and unfortunately the narrative, narrative that we've been using for a long time is selling insurance. We say you do this thing or terrible things are going to happen. Yeah. So, and the, and the thing is, I just, well, just wanted to add, if we, we're talking about de developers, you know, I've been posting and talking a lot about developers and addressing potential risks and, you know, and building DevSecOps frameworks. I think the problems normally the people struggle that because A, Developers don't hate KPIs in terms of looking at security. And B, normally to build an AppSec program, you need to change, you need to build secure, security into the into development sort of culture. And that can't happen in three, six, or yeah. even 12 months sometimes. It's a it's a big, you know, it's a big job to teach developers to do threat modeling to, to, to them understand the risk and, and mm -hmm. it's it's not easy. But but to to, to Dennis' point. Yes, they will only do what's in the Kanban board. But the question here is not what's in the Kanban board, is how do we get our stuff in there? And that's true priorities. You, you have to show risk. to them, you have to you show to them that the thing that you're, you're proposing is more important than that next feature. Uh, yes, and you use risk ownership for that. So, so the trick that I would now start to use, I mean, it works really well, is that every risk needs to be accepted. The only, the only variable is for how long, right? And, and the key here is to make the right person and the right organization chart accept the risk. Because what happens in most organizations, the security team is actually accepting a lot of risks on behalf of the business. Yes. Right? And the way, the way I look at this is that, let's say that I represent the security team, is that you represent the engineering function and Marius, you represent the business function, right? So the way it works is Marius comes along and says, we need to do X. Right for the business for this business objective, right? Is that you come and you map a plan, you hire a team, you're implementing it. Security comes along, go, hey guys, 
there's some side effects of security, we have to do this X, Y, Z, right? The key here is to give the risk and the, the why of those risks. Why is there a problem? Because this increases the exposure of this, exposure of that, compromises these bricks, compliance, you know, X, Y, Z. And it's Marius who needs to accept the risk. And now in this example, Marius, as a business owner, your only option is you want to accept the risk for a day, for a week, for a month, for six months, because what that means is that that delta is how long you expect it to be done, right? So if you say, oh, I'm, I'm not happy to accept this for more than two weeks, for example, you can only do that if you already have an item in the backlog, right? Because if the item is on the backlog, there's no way it's going to be done in two weeks. So if, even if you, from a business point of view, say, yeah, that's why, Harry, I'm not comfortable with those risks, uh, we can challenge you to say, yeah, but if you don't allocate resources in ESA's team, which represents the engineering team, then you're going to have to accept it for three, three months or six months or a month, because until you allocate resources, that risk will still be there. And, and that completely changes because the problem I always have with risk is we don't make the right people accountable for the decisions that they're making. And I guarantee, and every time you make somebody click on something, even adding an emoji to an answer or replying to an email, they know that we're making them accountable because we're creating a digital trail. And that I think is the key bit, is to create a digital trail with a business owner for the risks that they buy in, so they are become accountable when those risks materialize. So first of all, I'm gonna tell you, I'm a huge fan of personal accountability. I love your approach. Role, with, uh, role with accountability, right? Role. Yeah, let, let's say role. But my problem is actually exactly with that. We we live in a, in a in a reality right now that people rotate very fast between jobs. Yeah. So it goes up. Got, so somebody in that role accepted that risk. The next guy is going to come in. The first thing that he receives is a bond on his head of all the risks that he accepted. Yeah. Exactly, but that's that's exactly how it should be, right? Because, uh, the, but, but, but today what happens is the worst. Today what happens is a new person comes along and they have no idea what they just inherited. And, and by the way, the other key element here is that when you give risk to an individual, you're not giving the risk to that individual or that role, you're giving it to the whole food chain. So that means that you accept the risk on behalf of your manager, on behalf of your manager, on behalf of their manager. So the risk follow upwards. Right. And also we have also the power because we get to choose who ultimately is the ultimate arbitrator of risk, right? Because we can say, hey, you need to accept this, but your, your boss needs to underwrite it because actually this has bigger implications. So what we're doing is we're making the people accountable at the right level of the organization. So and in your example, when the person leaves, guess what? Their boss has all their risks and ultimately ends up on a CEO or the board because all risks have to go upwards. But, but then comes the question, are, are we creating a bit of institutional paralysis in here? Because you're going to start a dialogue that goes up and down the chain all the time. Do we accept this risk? Do we accept that risk? He accepted that one, but his manager won't. And now they have to have a, a yeah. discussion between them to see who, who accepts what. That's and, great. And, mm. Perhaps today is the worst. We get, you get that unofficially with no accountability, with people not paying attention because they know there's no accountability. Well, I, I, th I want to add a couple of things. There. I think I think in modern organizations, what we try and do nowadays, you can preempt some of these things. So we started yeah. building security champions network, uh, one thing yeah. to preempt the risks and get, get visibility in various departments. But secondly, in our organizations, and, and I'm a big fan of it, doing cybersecurity council. So normally, yeah. before you take things to the board, you have a, yeah. a council that is built up of, of management team that yeah. has already pre-approved your ideas and your solutions for risks exactly. and for yeah. everything else. So before it goes to the yeah. board, you already have a big support behind your back. Yeah. But that's key, right? Like the, the way this scales is that when you accept risks, you're also accepting that level of risk across a particular... So in a way, you, you create and get authority. In a way, is this done correctly actually accelerates the business because you now know what risks you're willing to accept versus what risks you're not willing to accept. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's probably similar as to, you know, thinking about AA language model. You build a model of, and you, because sometimes organizations, you know, it, you, you, especially when you come in and new, it's very hard to have a, a conversation of what's your risk appetite. Yeah. Because it goes up and down and especially it depends which department you're talking. Yeah. 
you know, because obviously, you know, innovation and developers, they're always going to be a more risk takers because they're all going to innovate. Whereas yeah. someone who's dealing with, you know, 2008 servers in IT, yeah. who's just barely standing on one stick, you know, they're not going to be as risk, you know, averse. Yeah. Yeah. And what you, what you want is make sure that, for example, your startup model does not have access to all the assets of the organization. Yeah. Right, and I think that's why risk is interesting because you can go, hey, you guys want to go 100 miles an hour, you want to have these shortcuts, which I get it from a development point of view, but you now, for example, need to accept the risk that you have access to all our customer data. <laughs> and, and, and immediately if you say that, they're gonna go, whoa, I don't want that risk. I don't want to have that responsibility. Go, okay, fine. Then you only, and then let's limit that. So until you give them that risk, they don't, they don't understand it, right? They don't. You know, like even for example, like GDPR, I had some really cool cases where there were the, 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 some teams wanted to capture a lot of this data, right? And then we basically said, okay, but if you capture all this data, you're going to have to accept all these GDPR risks. You're going to have to accept all these things and all these requirements that you now need to do, even something as simple as erasure, data erasure, right? When they when we gave them those risks, they start asking the question, why are we capturing this data? Why do we need it? Do we actually need this particular data for our business case? And they didn't, right? But it was a, giving them the risk was a much more business friendly way to say, look, we're not going to stay in front of what you want to do as a business, but you need to be able to take accountability for the risk that you're buying for the business, for what you're doing. Yeah. And that becomes a key, key you know, it sometimes even becomes, you know, people, I think, struggle with, it becomes a key skill. How do you follow this trend? You know, how do you ask specific questions yeah. to get to the bottom of the, the truth because sometimes people just get frustrated you know oh i can never get done with this and that or we can never do it or yeah. that but you get to the bottom of the root cause of why something is happening why there is a risk why somebody has to accept the risk why there is you know because people sometimes forget you know yes data is king but data collection comes with so many responsibilities and it's normally you know yeah. so many regulations especially you know it always says you only collect the data that you need for your business operations. And if you're mm -hmm. outside of that, it becomes very, very tricky. Very yeah, but you can use risk to, 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 drive, to drive that. Yeah. Imagine mm -hmm. he's doing a thread model. And we lost him again. Yeah. <laughs> But actually, you know, I, I agree with everything that you guys are saying, but it, it's just that all of a sudden risk is getting this huge profile and, and all of a sudden you need this huge operation around risk to identify, to justify, to manage. Dennis, we completely lost you for the, for the last 30 seconds. <laughs> I, I, I can hear you guys. It's really weird. I, I can hear you guys. <laughs> it's just we're going over. No, continue, continue. No, no, continue where you were. You are going to a, an interesting place. Go. Yeah, look, look I think the, the idea is that, you know, you, you need to make, right, you know, for, for that to scale, you have to, and actually going just to the point you were saying, right, like, this doesn't work if it doesn't scale. Right? And, and that's why I like the whole GPT stuff and the, the chat GPT stuff and the, and, and the next generation where you can feed it lots of data is the first time that I can see this can really scale because it can scale from the point of view of, you know, imagine feeding it all of GDPR, feeding it all of ISO 27,000, feeding it all also all AWS, you know, best practices, plus ASVS from OWASP, plus maturity model and say, okay, now here's my data. Now, what's my priority? So how do I put context into this particular risk that I have here, right? And more importantly, how do I then translate it to the multiple audiences that I need to communicate it to? Okay, that first part there, I'm allergic to the idea. The how to communicate, I'm totally for. But to let that kind of model make decisions for me at this point in, in the technology. No, no, no. I, I, I didn't say make decisions. I said make, give me context. Eh, that, that could... I think loads of things depends how you build your enterprise risk management framework. Is it? Because, yep. for example, you know, I'm a big fan that, you know, we have a risk code, but we only talk about risk code about the top, top things. Yeah. So I have a cyber, I have a cyber risk yeah. register, which houses however many risks. But the ones that go to risk code is the ones that 
you know, within the context within now and, and you know, today, we yep. need to address. And, it, yep. and the thing is, uh, the key point is, it's always changing. Things are happening. Mm -hmm. The risk goes up yeah. and down. And the one key thing as well, sometimes I want, I, I want to mention that I think sometimes people really forget. You mentioned, Dennis, about accepting risk. Yeah, accepting risk or accepting risk with, um, with an end date in mind. But there's another thing. Yeah. Sometimes people, when they reach a risk that goes to an acceptable level, they close it. You never close the risk because... No, no, no. You accept line, it. Something you added and the risk profile changed completely and now it became from low risk, became medium, and then all of a sudden, yeah. another month later, became a high risk. Yeah. Yeah, but, that, but that's why you don't close it. You accept it. It's very different. Yeah. You don't exactly. close it, you accept it, and that's very different? Uh, I'm stuck yes. on that. Oh. Well, closing a risk implies that it's done, right? Implies that we, we got rid of it, right? So right. I, I would say close is close to eliminate because you can eliminate some risks, right? Or put it this way, you can bring it to the level where they're not statistically significant, right? So you don't have to care about it. But accepting is saying I can live with it and yes, it's absolutely. under my risk appetite. Exactly. And I'm not going to fix it. Yes, but I'm taking responsibility for it. Because that's what the business does every day. Yeah. Every business executive every day makes business acceptance decisions. I invest here, I invest there, I live with this, I'm rolling the dice here, I'm hoping that that will happen. All those are risks. Right? right. But what they're doing is they're accepting the risk. What, what we're doing here is formalizing that. But we're formalizing so that they're accountable. Yeah. Right? And, and what's interesting about this is notice how so many business risk decisions are made in meetings. And sometimes it's like you will say X, Y, Z, and somebody very senior goes, mm, I'm not sure I agree with that. That's a risk decision. <laughs> it's like at that moment in time they just they just said i don't want to do this what you need to give them is that little piece of paper going cool then go on a record right yeah right? We, because we did that before as well we what we do sometimes as well we underpin uh for example a cyber security program based on level of threat sophistication so we say yeah. for example yeah. me as a company i say i can't invest enough money to prevent you know, state-sponsored threat actors. So yes. we're going to work yeah. up to the level of cybercrime, but I'm not yeah. going to try and invest millions and millions to prevent from, yeah. you know, state-sponsored uh, threat actors because it will just not be financially viable. Or you haven't hit them, right? Or you haven't you haven't got to the point where you've been compromised by a state actor and the board asks you, protect us from them, right? But, it, yeah. but you'd be a very different company. So if you think about what you just there was you create a risk decision. The risk decision is that we're not going to protect ourselves against state-sponsored actors with this kind of sophistication. But that's the risk decision. Yeah, yeah, of course. But that's one I would say, well, you can do it for six months or a year because in principle, it's not going to change. You know, but you can keep going down, right? You can then say, I'm not going to protect myself against highly sophisticated Actors. Or, for example, you can say, I'm not going to protect ourselves against activists because we have a great brand, because our brand does not have activists hitting it. And because I have no evidence at the moment of being hit by activists, right? Or the other way around, right? I'm not going to protect ourselves against commercially driven actors because it's really hard to make money with our digital access, but I'm going to protect ourselves against activists because we get fucking being hit all the time by that. But those are <laughs> risk decisions. Dennis, I, I, I feel like I have to throw a, 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 a bit of a bucket of cold water in, in this because you're describing this, this amazing framework where you have access to all kinds of intelligence and understanding and you have these people sitting up in the top saying, we, we're willing to accept this and this is our trajectory. Meanwhile, I have a developer that I can't even stop doing an SQLi. <laughs> okay, so, but, you know, it, 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 it goes yeah, a bit... It, it, we're building yes, but... the whole risk treatment factory here, while at the ground level, we are not getting the most basic risks killed. No, okay, we, start, we start, still have okay, the same then, vulnerabilities then, then, as we had 10 years ago. No, no, but then, yes and no, right? But, but okay, start with that guy, right? Okay, you have a developer creating SQL injection, all right? Does it matter? What's the implications of that SQL injection? Yeah, there's a, there's a few things, obviously, yeah, you have to answer. Right. What kind of data is he working with? Yeah, exactly. With? Is there going to be sensitive data? But I think there's two ways you can angle it, isn't it? I always I always tell people, you know, you work you work top down and bottom up. 
So bottom up, you obviously find out about the data is working, does this matter? But then secondly, normally, when I build an AppSack program, you have to get you know development managers on board, but you have to yeah. go to them. You have to build security KPIs, and then we, we have to talk. You know, because I I hate about this one thing normally that breaks down when we talk about de developers break you know fixing security stuff. We go into their world. We bring our security tools. We we go into their platforms, whether they work in Jira, whatever they work. We bring yeah. the platforms to the Jira, so we. We create a context. We prioritize. We create risks. Yeah. You know, we, we we can't do you know from SaaS output ten thousand you know tickets and try and solve it. No, you have yeah. the context. You marry yeah. that with SaaS DAST and SEA, and you yeah. create a, a risk narrative where you know how how, how long is the, you know what's the you know what's the impact of this particular you yeah. know what data is going to touch yeah. what what app is going to work with you create KPIs with the with the people that are going to manage those developers and, and yeah. you work together to to create a plan. Yeah, what's the top so, five things we want them to fix next week, right? We should great. be able so, to give them that, right? So let, let me close that loop for a second. We, we started with the divide between risk from the point of view of the board and, and from the point of view of the developer. Now we are bringing that together, saying there is a framework, somebody decides the risk appetite, and now the developer has to execute based on that. Yeah. Where in you guys' mind sits the decider of what is it that the developer will do next based on that risk profile? Who, who, who is the function? What's the role that actually gets to decide what's go, what goes next in the... It depends how you build. In the I build I'm normally done frameworks and I've been a big, big, big of a fan of what AWS does. So I normally build plans similar to what they do. So you have a development team, say, of build, teams are built of six, seven, eight people, whatever it is. You have a security champion in each development team. Yep. That there's the person who you gather them all and you teach them about risk, about impact, about the likelihood, and they will become your essentially threat modeling champions and they will identify the risk. And then you create a, a sort of, a, they call it a security bar or a sort of a level of where the risk is. If that risk exceeds that level, they there is an escalation point so you create appsec engineers so normally i will say one engineer per three development teams so that gets escalated and then we do a second round of threat modeling to see if we can reduce that and then there is a, a penetration test and, and a sort of a gateway into the release into production to me you're describing a, a nirvana situation where in the best of all known worlds that would be the, the well the yeah way but that, that, that's the framework you know getting there yeah. that's why i said to you yeah. before, you know getting yeah. there is normally that's why i say to people people think oh we're going to start doing appsec yeah but normally yeah. that framework until it's operational is a, i always say to people it's 18 months yeah. developers when they haven't done security you can't just say oh we're going to start doing security tomorrow it's a cultural shift it takes effort it takes training you create security champions do you think these people want to be security champions for nothing you have to create reward programs like we send yeah. developers to like you know something like black hat rsa's there, there's tangible rewards you become a security specialist on a team then yeah. you hire obviously the security app security, security engineers you bring all the tools you know the toolings fine fine tuning the tooling and you know false positives false negatives that takes however many months to get to the point you know this all reaches a culmination in 18 months, you get somewhere close to that, what you say is an Nirvana. No, no, I, I love what you're selling. I, I think that that's definitely like paradise sounds like that. Yeah. yeah. But my God, we are so far from paradise. Like oh, how many, oh, how many companies yeah. do you know that actually do exactly what, you, what, what you're describing? Oh, can you, can count on that fingers. you can count on fingers. And, and, and then when you finish training those people in those roles, they move. <laughs> they're, they're, they're just gone. So, I mean, we, we need something that we can use immediately. Like somebody just came in, got onboarded. Dude, this is risk for us here. These are our priorities. This is what you do. This is what you don't. We don't have time to build that, that huge runway to get to the, the, the desired state. And, and, I think, and I think that's where we are sort of heading that way because we're starting to bring security tools into development IDE. So we, we started going away from, you know, going to the boards and stuff like that. Nowadays, developer types code and in IDE, it gets straight away pointers to ways. And now they're even adding risk. You're just quantifying and creating a, some sort of framework of what needs fixing now versus 
you can push into production and we accept the risk and then there's a timeline for the fix. And then you just probably quantify, you know, critical high, we fix now and then, medium lows, you have a time limit. So you built in SLAs and it can go into production because then you you prevent from them innovate. You, you're not preventing them from innovating, but at the same time, you, you know, you're keeping security in terms. Got it. Is this the time when we? But uh, if I, if I can, if, I, I just wanted to just add a comment on, on when you said about who owns the risk. I think yes, you know, the, the closer you can be to the technology teams and the engineering teams, the better, right? And and I have to say that these days there's a much bigger realization by engineering teams that they need to be secure, right? I think. I, I would, I would, I feel like these are the best parts of what he has to say. Yeah. Yo, I, think he just, I think he just presses something. He's like, I go great idea. Let me press a button to to, look, to freeze. That, there's probably an app for that. Yeah. Must be something in there. I would say the real ones. I'm going on a rain here. You go to there's no reception. Yeah, no. It's like I'm on a South Bank <laughs> in London. All right, can you guys hear me now? I, yeah, I think yeah. you're taking the idea of sure. mobile way too far. Yeah. Well, look, I just finished off saying, I think you need to give it to the business owner, right? You need to give it to the person who controls the development, the pipeline. Those are the ones who have to own the risk. But the key is to make it official. And it's not easy, man. It takes a lot of time and effort. But I think that's the direction of traffic is to give them the risks to accept. Yeah, because, definitely. I because, think sometimes, sometimes people even forget. I keep want to keep yeah. going to the point, you know, we mentioned yeah. kind of thing you mentioned in the beginning saying, you know, security owns too many risks. Security yeah. shouldn't own even a single risk. Yes. Security, security is a consultative function to the business that provides, you know, you provide ideas what business to do. But if 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 you do if any of if any of the risks are owned by security, then I, I would say you're doing something wrong. Yeah. Totally agreed. Yeah. Yeah, the only risks that we should own are the risks that we need to own from our own business function outside of security. For the security tools, for example, that we push, then we need to own those risks. Yeah, and, and, and you know what? As a business it? owner, as a business owner, that's the risk we should own, not the business risks. I, I think that, Marius, you, you, you touch on a, on a really, really important point that uh, we as security people have to make peace with. Yeah. We are not as important as we think. <laughs> we, we are here for consultancy, right? So we don't have to own risk. We shouldn't. And if we are doing it, we are doing it wrong. So we, well, yeah. I, I, I agree, agree with the second part, not the first part. But I think we are a very important <laughs> part of the future. No, we are very important. Uh -huh. but, people, but people forget, you know, we're not there to... Because sometimes we create, so, we create such a stories about the risk that, you know, might prevent business operations. Yep. We're not there we to do, stop yeah. business operations because oh, yeah. of risks. But then we, we should there to enable job. business and make those operations just more secure. And that's the key point. Uh, Sometimes people, especially people you know in senior cybersecurity positions, they they keep saying no. And the problem is the more you yeah. say no, the less likely you are to be listened yeah. to. And then yeah. at some point you lose the seat by the table and yeah. then you get frustrated because you can't do anything because you yeah. caused it yourself. Well, Don't look, you. I always tell the board and the senior exec, I said, my job is not to prevent incidents. My job is to prevent crisis, right? And, I, and our job is not to make this secure, it's to make it safe. And yep. it's a very different proposition. Yeah. Cool, guys. Look, top of the hour. Any final thoughts? This is a great session. We need to do more of these. Love the sessions. Yeah. And you, you should make a, a different event, Dinners in the Park, where you talk to people <laughs> when you walk. <laughs> what do you think of risk? Yeah. Playing, them. Playing, playing banjo and talking about security. <laughs> Actually, I, I'm about to go to an event here in London with tons of security professionals. I should go there and, and get them on here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Then I'm going to a CISO event. Cool. Any awesome. final words, guys? It's a risky business. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's risky business, but I think, I think the main point we'll be touching, you know, it's a journey and it takes yeah. a lot of work to get to, to a certain, you know, level of risk treatment maturity. But it just, 
it, it, it needs a change of thoughts, a change of narrative and a change of approach. Yeah. You know, yes. I always say to people, you know, there, there's one key saying here, you know, stop doing the same things if you expect different outcome. Exactly. Yeah. That's what we need exactly. to keep. You know, yeah. we need to yeah. we need to we need some fresh ideas, we need fresh, fresh, you know, outlook of how we address the risk going forward. But yeah. yeah. And the and the best part, man, we work in an industry that can still be super passionate about what we do, love what we do, and, and make a difference, right? Come on, totally. that's, that's awesome. Exactly. exactly. It's, it, it's all about making a difference. And, and, and I think, you know, just a caveat to that, I think the industry itself is, is probably nothing like anywhere else you would meet, because I've never met so many individuals that do stuff out of passion, uh, yeah. you know, serve their time and their and efforts to help others without any rewards and you know i've been involved yeah. loads in mentoring and and all kinds of things and and the rewarding you know and you always say you know just pay it forward and, and i've yeah. never seen that anywhere totally. in, in such a magnitude as in cyber security yeah. yeah. i agree it's a, it's a great industry to, to be part of man you know it's super cool <laughs> all yeah. right guys cool. catch thank you very much marius thank, thank you very much it was a pleasure pleasure thank you great. see you